Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Accelerate Your Performance podcast. I'm your host, Janet Pilcher. Thanks for having a desire to be your best at work and help your organization achieve success. This podcast is all about actions we can take to improve workplace culture and achieve results. And they're all aligned to our nine principles framework. Let's jump into today's episode. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest, Angela Frazier, author, and Sherry Simmons. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about them. Angela serves as the Vice President of Student Services at Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin. She has more than 25 years of higher education experience in various roles with a major emphasis on student success. Angela joined Waukesha County Technical College in June of 2020 and currently oversees several departments, which include admissions, academic advising, career connections, counseling, financial aid, global education, registration, student development, and student accessibility. Before joining the Technical College, she spent 15 years in a variety of of roles at Dominican University in River Forest, based in the U.S., including serving as Vice President of Student Success and Engagement. Sherry Simmons serves as the Chief Diversity and Compliance Officer at Waukesha County Technical College. In her current role, she has played a key role in helping Waukesha County Technical College institutionalize diversity, equity, inclusion, and compliance efforts on campus. Prior to this role, she served the college as Director of Compliance and Equity, and before that, she served as compliance officer. Sherry has worked in education for more than 22 years. Her roles have also included director of residence life and housing, as well as graduate residence director. Both Angela and Sherry were named one of the 40 notable women in education by the Biz Times Milwaukee. I'm excited about today's conversation with Sherry and Angela. Today, we'll discuss what it looks like to create a space for more and deeper inclusivity in colleges, universities, and schools. They'll share with us what it looks like, feels like, and sounds like to lead diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts at this moment in time at a technical college. As you'll hear in this episode, Angela and Sherry are champions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Angela and Sherry to the show today. Welcome, Angela. Hello. Good morning. Glad to have you and welcome, Sherry. Hello. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So um, let's start off. Love to hear a little bit about each of you, your background, and for our listeners to understand a little bit more about you. So Angela, can you tell us about your role as Vice President of Student Services as well as what Uh, led you to to this field of work? Thank you for having me and thank you for asking that question. I've been in higher ed for my son just turned 28, so like 27 years, and I kind of fell into higher education. I am a first-generation college graduate and went off to college 12 hours away from home and ended up being on, I was a student trustee, And I loved that experience. And I, at that moment, I decided I wanted to stay in higher education. And so just continued along that trajectory. And I started off as an academic advisor for TRIO. Um, I was a, you know, student support services advisor and just continued to learn as much as I possibly could about all aspects of higher education. You know, I teach part-time. I like to stay in the classroom so that I'm connected to students. And then, you know, I took a three-year hiatus. I got married, moved to West Africa, and wow. um, and I missed it. I miss working. And so I found this position. I'm from Wisconsin. I'm originally from Wisconsin. I saw this position at Waukesha County Technical College, and it was the vice president of student services. And it really encompassed all the things that I'm passionate about, you know, ensuring that students have access to every single opportunity that is available And so I applied and now I'm the vice president of student services. I started during a pandemic and I also started (laughs) while I was still in Ghana, West Africa. So that was true remote working and it has been an enjoyable experience, primarily because I've had the opportunity to work with Sherry and really kind of lead on some initiatives that are not just 
for right now, but systematic changes that will impact the work that we have started will still live on after we're no longer here. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. Such a, such a fun and interesting background. And, and you're right. It's nice to be part of a part of something that, you know, you're establishing and that will continue. So it has to be exciting work there. So Sherry, can you tell us a bit about your role and that entails as a chief diversity and compliance officer and what led you to this work? Sure. And thanks again for having us um, and being able to share our story with you. Um, So like Angela, I too am a first generation college student. I was only three hours away from home. I went to (laughs) East Carolina University. I'm originally from North Carolina. Okay. (laughs) Yay. Go Pirates. And (laughs) I... um, And it was actually my hall director who saw some leadership skills and abilities in me and said, I think that you are going to have um, a really good life and career in student affairs. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because as a college student, you don't know that student affairs is a path for you. You really don't know. And so I, I got involved. And after I graduated, I found positions that allowed me to have just a bachelor's degree to give me an opportunity to see if I wanted to get a master's in this area and continue that work. And so I did. Um, I started out in residence life and housing. Um, I went into student conduct, um, some international education experience. Um, So that's kind of how I got started. And then along the way, picked up like human resources. And at that time, diversity, equity, and inclusion weren't one of those things that people were talking about. You kind of knew what was going on in the background, but it wasn't in the forefront. And so I knew that I was someone who liked hearing people's stories, wanted to give credibility to their experiences and their feelings. And so it just kind of blossomed that when I was in this position here at Waukesha County Technical College as their compliance officer, and I was doing Title VII and Title IX work, that this position as the Chief Diversity and Compliance Officer came open, and it gave me an opportunity to work with employees and students on building diversity, equity, and inclusion awareness, providing um, opportunities for them to learn more about it. Um, And then again, continuing that Title VII and Title IX work that I kind of started out with. So that's kind of how I got in the field and kind of got promoted into this position as the CDCO. Yeah, it's interesting how, um, you know, I think we all think we, people think we set out to achieve X, Y, and Z and take these steps. And if we talk about our how we got to particular places, you know, that's not the case, right? It's that like one experience and what we are passionate about leads to another. And as you all, you all have built the foundation of the work at, at uh, WCTC and done some incredible, incredible work there. So let's talk a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Sherry, if you would, you know, could you tell us about the three years of data that's been collected um, on the campus from employees and students um, about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Sure. So we have been very fortunate to work with Dr. Gail Duno Butler, who is one of the the leader coaches for Studer, to kind of craft what um, our experience in terms of DEI would look like. And so she helped us come up with 23 questions that we do, um, that we have on our employee engagement survey that we do every year that we employ out to our um, employees. And so from those questions, we were able to gauge what how the college was feeling about DEI efforts, where we should be going, um, what does the leadership and what their responsibilities in making all of this happen on our campus is. And so we were able to get that information. And I would say after our first year that we did this, we're now in year four. So after our first year, leadership looked at those results and said, we really need to make DE&I a priority. Our employees are telling us we need to do this. We really need to get behind that and really make something happen. And so we created a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, which is comprised of a cross-functional team of people across campus that was really looking at the state of DE&I at that time and where we needed to move forward. Um, We were getting feedback about, can people really be their authentic self at work? And the answer to that question was no. And so how do we work to make sure they can do that? Um, Also talking about would we, as current employees, would we go out and recruit other underrepresented students and employees to come to WCTC? And some people were saying no, just because of their experiences that they were feeling on campus. And so really taking all of that feedback that we received from those, um, the, from those results and really taking that and planning out 
what we what we need to do to become that premier institution that people feel like they are valued, they belonged, no matter where they're coming from. And so those results gave us an opportunity to really hone in and do that. Yeah. I think that's so important, Sherry. I mean, first of all, that you look at the data, you know, you got, you ask people for, um, for their thoughts and their input. You really look at the data. You talk about that with your committee and your teams um, and, and you dissect what you're, what you're learning from it. Right. And, you know, I think that's really important because it's not just another initiative. It's not just a program, (laughs) you know, but it really is creating what I hear you say, what you all have done is good conversation around input and trying to then move that to action to see what we can do to con- to build some improvements and then learn from those. That is absolutely correct because I think a lot of times we do a lot of talking and not mm-hmm. a lot of action. And so this was that roadmap that helped us get to where we need it to be. And um, yeah, so time yeah. is out for the talking. It's really yeah, and, you know, the work. And then and then people say, you know, people ask us, how do you how do people become engaged? Well, that's it, right? That's engagement. People are actually because they they're interested in talking about and solving problems on things that really help build a better workplace and, you know, have care and concern for people and value people and give them a good sense of belonging. You know, so as we continue to think about that, Angela, I know you all have learned a lot in the process. You know, so what have you learned in the process and how do you gain momentum for action for change now? Uh, I love that question. And I just want to say about the data as well, that one of the things that Sherry is not telling us is that she does a really good job of tracking our equity data. And we, one of the things that we learned was that we have all this data and we're not doing anything with it. And so, or people cannot access it. So one of the things that I learned is that you've got to create data where people can access. And, you know, we started with this DEI team. It's now called the IDEA team because we wanted to be sure that we included, it's called inclusion, diversity, equity, um, as well as accessibility, because, you know, disabilities, they don't discriminate. You know, it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, African-American, Latinx, you know, and so we changed that. And that was based on our data. But we created this data dashboard, you know, and I love this data dashboard because I'm a data geek. And so one of the things that I learned is that we have this data, but it's not accessible. So now with the creation of the data dashboard, everyone can access what does our student population look like? What are their successes as well in their courses, you know, if you disaggregate the data? And so we had to learn that you can create, you can collect data, but you've got to access it. The other thing that we learned is that people, a lot of this was driven right after George Floyd. So I will tell you that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Sherry can add something to it. When I was hired, going through the interview process, they, they shared with me, oh, we're going to get a chief diversity officer. We're going to get a chief diversity officer. And then, you know, when I started, they were like, oh, we're going to wait, we're going to wait. And there was no action behind it. And then George Floyd happened. And so there was this urgency to hire this position. So I learned in the process is that sometimes external things happen that really push you to make decisions and to act. And to give you the momentum that you need in order to do the work. And it shouldn't take that because we've had incidents on our campus. We've had, you know, faculty and staff of color say that they don't feel safe, you know. And so that should have been the momentum. But it was really George Floyd that was the momentum to make changes. The other thing that I learned or to get action to happen is that you really have to have diverse stakeholders as a part of your team. Mm -hmm. You've got to have representatives from student services, from learning, from the administrative side, you know, from executive leadership, they have to buy into the overall vision. And if they don't buy in, you're going to be on this long road and it's going to seem like it's never going to end. And so having diverse stakeholders that could be your champions really has made all the difference. And I'm sure Sherry can talk about creating champions to continue to help with the change. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to hear Sherry. Yeah. So one of the things that we did this year is created um, DEI champions and they are, um, it's just a person from each of the schools that we have. 
So we have five individual schools on our campus, School of Applied Technologies, School of Business, School of Community and Personal Development, the School of Health, and Academic Foundations and General Studies. And so there's a person, a faculty member from each of those schools that sit on our IDEA team. And it's just a way for us to collaborate what is going on within the faculty areas, what is going on across the campus, what are some things that you're hearing that we need to be thinking about and making some change for. Um, and so it's just a really, really good time for us to, again, continue those conversations on how we can move DEI work forward. Um, something that I would say that I've learned is that now going into year two as a chief diversity officer, sometimes you feel like your position was created just to be a position. Like yeah. it's something that we did, like Angela yeah. said, after George yeah. Floyd, <laughs> after the civil unrest of 2020, oh, we all need to go out and create these chief diversity officer positions. But sometimes you feel powerless and you feel like you can't really make the change that you want to on your campus to affect, you know, all these changes that you know need to happen because not everybody buys into it or everybody agrees that what you're doing. And so you feel sometimes that you are in a vacuum and that you're operating alone. But like, again, Angela said, you need the vice president of academic affairs to work with you if you need to change the curricula, because we have students that said, we want to see a diversity course. Great. You know, students are coming forward and saying, we know that we're going into a multicultural society. How are you as an institution preparing mm -hmm. us for that? Mm -hmm. And a diversity course will help mm -hmm. with that. We know that we need to work with our vice president of finance and administration for budget implications. How are we going to make all of this happen? And so again, it's learning how to get those stakeholders and get that buy-in so we can continue the work that needs to be done based off the data that has been presented to us. Yeah, I think so good. You know, you're in going back to, um, you know, just actions that people take. It's just a check off of compliance to hire a chief diversity officer, you know, and so that's, yep. that's not the right thing to do, right? <laughs> um, and so what, what I think you all have done, you know, that's model, um, is, you know, you, you have some, you have leaders, the two of you really as leaders leading the effort, but it's, it's, a uh, it's looking, it's a combination of looking at the data, engaging teams in mm -hmm. those conversations. And what I hear you say, Jerry, you know, you're having those champions that are across the, the colleges or the schools that are also um, connected in a very significant way from a leadership way as well. So you're building those kind of leaders within your institution that are helping you champion the work in the right way. Not because here's, here's what we said we want are going to mm -hmm. do, but we're, we're pulling input in so that we're directing that path. And I just, I think that's su such a, such a learning for all of us, you know, as we think about ways that we um, do the right things um, to make the, the impact that's needed right. um, and to make the changes. So just a little bit, you know, Angela, I'll start with you. You know, what are, what are the obstacles you faced along the way? You know, <laughs> there are always those, uh, you know, how do you, and how do you address them? I will say, so the first obstacle, um, when this position, when Sherry's position was created, she wasn't reporting directly to the president. Um, she was actually split between myself and HR. And that didn't make sense to me at all because we know that in order for the institution to look at themselves from an equitable lens, an inclusion lens, you really need to have the ear of the president. So that was a big obstacle. Um, and I just could not get the other members of leadership to see why it needs to be a direct report. When we got a new president, then we overcame that obstacle, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, Sherry's now a direct report to our president. But that was a major obstacle because if you want to make systematic changes, you re it really needs to start at the top. You know, another obstacle was just getting the funding. I will tell you, and Sherry will probably use that as an obstacle as well, but it's like, People want you to piece together or pull money from different budgets, you know, but not to have d diversity, equity, and inclusion to have their own budget, you know. And so Sherry had been sharing a budget with myself. She had been sharing it with HR. She had been pulling some student activity fees. And it just was like, wait, 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 are we serious about you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion? If so, we've got to put the money behind it. I had a faculty member in my doctoral program that said, no money, no mission. And that was her, that was her whole phrase, no money, no mission. And it's just like, 
if we are serious, then we have to create a legitimate budget so that the work can be facilitated and that we can recognize the changes that have happened. So, you know, it took a year and a half. I mean, Sherry is still fighting for some additional budget dollars, but I'd say, you know, those were the two major obstacles that I felt is getting that direct reporting line to the president and really creating a budget line that was conducive to do the actual work. Yeah. Love it. Because that shows commitment. I mean, that's true yes. commitment, you know, yes. reporting structure and dollars, right? Show, yeah, we mean this. This is true commitment. That's great. What are, what are your thoughts, Sherry? I would say the misinformation that's out there about yes. diversity, equity, and inclusion, specifically critical race theory, what it is, what it isn't, um, also academic freedom, and you know what courses can be taught. And I know here in Wisconsin, there was some legislation that was proposed that didn't get passed that basically said we couldn't use the words diversity, equity, inclusion, cultural competence, like anything that referenced DEI could not be used for training purposes or anything like that. And so hearing those things and and knowing that people believe those things to be true, how do we as an institution educate our employees and our students about the truth of critical race theory and what it is? Um, about academic freedom. And so we really do a lot of educational opportunities where we train and teach our employees, what is cultural competence? What does it mean? What is overcoming unconscious bias and code switching and things of that nature? So really doing a lot of training to combat what other people are saying, you know, DE&I is or isn't. Um, So that's been a huge obstacle that I don't know that it's going to go away in years time, but it's something that we are fighting. I would say, too, um, one of the things that we learned from Studer is how you take, you know, your values from your walls and you put them in the hall. And so relationships is one of the values that we have. And if we're not building positive relationships with our stakeholders, with our employees, with our students, if our students are always feeling like they're not being heard or they're not being treated fairly in the classroom, if our employees feel like, you know, they're being retaliated against for coming for coming forward, you know, sharing a complaint, Mm -hmm. then how are we building those relationships? And so working with our hiring managers, working with, you know, the employees and saying, you're, you matter and you value, and we need to believe you. And so really getting people to understand that um, because it takes courage and bravery for somebody to come forward and said, this is my experience. It may not be the ideal experience that everybody is feeling, but Mm -hmm. it's mine. And so making sure that people feel that they can do that in a safe and in a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, two things. I mean, just just so important, uh, you know, the ability for people to to have that that care and concern, the environment that exhibits care and concern for the human being, you know, for the person that you are, and that we're here to listen to you and listen to tr- to help move our institution forward in a positive direction around the external factors that are influencing us, um, but also have great care and concern for you as an individual in that process. And I think, you know, I think that's I mean, first of all, some great obstacles. I mean, some from just the structural piece and then others from the external factors and and then mm-hmm. just what we do in general to build relationships with people. Um, and I think that's right. You know, we're, what, we, what we're facing today, you know, we never probably envisioned we would face, right? Um, I know I didn't. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it, it's um, I mean, in, in certain ways it makes sense, but in other ways we're, we're facing obstacles that, you know, Sherry, what I, what I've, what I have really thought through and you alluded to it is in some ways, I feel like it's a, uh, that we've, we've missed in the education system along the way of not building the educational component for our young people to get to adulthood, you know, to understand things in a way that we need to, um, to build a good place to live and, and work and care for each other as people, you know, and I just, I, I sit down and reflect quite a bit on where have we missed, you know, where have we yeah. missed at K-12, <laughs> where have we missed in call in higher ed, you know, where have we missed? I don't have the answer to that, but it's certainly a question that I continue to ask. So, you know, the work that you're doing is, is powerful and meaningful because we've got to kind of, I think, make up for what we've missed, but we've also got to, correct where we've missed and start um, at the very beginning of a person's education in some way. Um, 
so sorry, just just very really passionate about 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 this what you all are talking about and, and the need there. So I, I'd like to close with just if you all would just provide some closing thoughts as our listeners are are listening and you said, you know, here's here's a here's something I'd like you to take away with, or here's a closing thought that I have to summarize, you know, what would that be? Um, So Angela, I'll start with you if you don't mind. I think for me is that for anybody that is embarking on this process, not to be afraid of the unknown and to the messiness and the obstacles, because you know that what you're doing is the right thing. If I think about what you just shared regarding like our education system and when, when should this have happened, you know, and it's like, since it didn't happen through K through 12 and it's happening in higher ed, or if it is happening in K through 12, don't be afraid of, you know, the messiness of it, because at the end, your final outcome or your deliverables, a term that we often often overuse is that there will be changed lives and that we know that in the next five to 10 years, we are going to see a more brown student body, you know, and so how do we prepare ourselves for the browning of higher education? And that is a a shift in the way that we think and operate, and we become diverse ready instead of making the students feel like they've got to be ready, but we become as institutions diverse ready. And I'm very happy of the work that we have started here at WCTC and the work that we're continuing because we're we're trying to prepare ourselves for who our students are going to be. So, and don't be afraid of the unknown and the messy, I, because it's messy work. So I would, I would say that it's messy work. Yeah, great advice. Sherry? I would say find those allies and advocates in your organizations that will hold hands and stand with you through this work. And I'm very, very fortunate that I have that in Angela and there are other people across campus as well, but you need that. You need that on days when it's tough, when you want to give up and say, what am I doing? But those people can push you along. And so you need to find your support system in this work because it's going to be very, very beneficial and helpful, helpful for you as you move through this. Um, And I would also say too that um, get a survey and find what your employees are looking for. I will tell you that that employee engagement survey that we do through student education really helped us to find where we needed to be and what we needed to do. And I think who else in employee getting that information from your sur- from your employees to figure out what that needs to be. So survey your employees. It's very important. Yeah. And it begins to build the conversation and give them a voice. And, and, and I'll always say if we move the input to action, right? Yes. We get the input, but the key is where we usually miss is moving that input to action. And it, even if we, you know, it's even if we take action and we have to, and it's messy and we have to come back and redo that. That's okay. We're at least taking action to try to move in the right direction. And that's what you all are doing. Wow. What a, you know, what a, what a, um, what a team you are. I mean, Angela and Sherry, just thank you. The, the, the work that you do and the connection that you have with each other and the value you provide um, to WCTC um, is phenomenal. You know, just, I really, really enjoyed our conversation today and glad we had this opportunity and look forward to, to more more time, spending more time with you all and continuing to learn from you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Wow. What a, what an incredible interview with two incredible individuals who have contributed so much to higher education and to students and to our communities. I can't thank them enough for being with us today and, and how much I've learned from them as we've had the conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I hope that you all gain something that you can take back with you to your work environments. Thank you, Angela and Sherry. If you're interested in more leadership content, head over to studereducation.com slash events. There you can register for some free webinars we have coming up with leadership topics that will help you finish the year strong. Our next webinar is in one month. The topic is looking back to plan ahead for the next hiring season. Find out how to register at studereducation.com slash events and click on the event on the right-hand side of the page. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Performance. We invite you to connect with us on social media. There you'll find the latest episodes and previews of what's coming up. 
Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And I look forward to connecting with you next time as we continue to focus on the nine principles framework so that we can be our best at work. Have a great week.